to officially welcome bienvenidos to today's core coffee chat about transformational approaches to creating economic equity. I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments, along with Nicole Young. We're your host today, and we're joined by Maria Cadenas, who's the Executive Director of Ventures. And as you can hear, today's session is held in English with Spanish interpretation. Gisela Carrascos is providing consecutive interpretation right now, and will also translate your written comments and questions. And soon we'll switch to simultaneous interpretation, which is provided by Stella Lauerman. And with that, I'll turn it over to Nicole Young, who will give us an overview of CORE. Thanks, Nicole. So uh, for those of you that may not know, CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. And we think of it as both a funding model and a movement uh, to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. So there's a lot packed into that statement there, but we use the mission statement and the vision statement on this slide to really uh, remind us of uh, what CORE is all about. So CORE has evolved over the last several years. Uh, again, we use words like collective action, safe, healthy community, equitable opportunities for all to, to thrive really as um, our guide throughout this work. And these mission statements and vision statements that you see here were developed uh, with a lot of collaborative input and insights gathered from many different people over the years um, from different nonprofits and local government agencies and community groups. And when we say things like equitable health and well-being, we mean that all people across the lifespan uh, would have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent core conditions for health and well-being, and that people's opportunities and their life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse, or that the differences in outcomes aren't predictable by things like race, ethnicity, income level, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, zip code, or any other types of social identities. And so as both a funding model and a movement, CORE provides us a framework to align our priorities and programs and policies and funding and the results that we're working towards, and really to do that using community-wide goals uh, and common language uh, to help us really think about how we all play a part in creating the core conditions for health and well-being. And equity is at the center of this diagram uh, to illustrate and remind us that we have to constantly examine and address not only our individual, but our organizational and systemic beliefs and practices and structures um, that are often the very things that perpetuate the inequities that, that we're trying to eliminate. And so today's topic around transformational approaches to creating economic equity um, is going to be such a great example of what we mean by, it's not just about providing services, um, that alone won't get us to equity, but really looking at what are the underlying structures and systems and mindsets that also have to be transformed and shifted. And events like today's Core Coffee Chat are offered as part of the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact, or Core Institute. So think of the Core Institute as the learning arm of Core Investments, <clears throat> where we offer an array of training and technical assistance and other learning opportunities for people across different sectors to build the knowledge and skills and systems that we need to be able to fulfill our collective vision of an equitable, thriving, resilient community. And so I am very pleased to introduce Maria Cadenas, the Executive Director from Ventures, who will share uh, some information with us today about Ventures programs, but really from the lens or the perspective of how these programs really are transformational in and of themselves, but how they really are ways to um, break down those kind of inequitable systems that, uh, that lead to differences in opportunities and outcomes for uh, members of our community. And so I am going to turn it over to Maria um, to share more with us. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, 
Buenos dias a todos. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, your time this morning. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited to not only share our journey of learning uh, in terms of equity and systems, but also within the organization as much as without it, but to learn from you who are attending today. You go to the next slide, please, Nicole. Again, my name is Maria Cadenas. I'm the Executive Director for Ventures. And just a little bit of my history to kind of ground where I'm coming from. Um, prior to joining Ventures, I was leading the global strategy for a for-profit company in agriculture, including their economic development in rural areas across the U.S., Mexico, and Chile. And prior to that, I was the director of a public foundation focused on LGBTQ social change philanthropy. Um, and I also, in that role, I served for a racial equity initiative across LGBTQ funders across the U.S., um, and then, and before that, I was the Associate Director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Wisconsin, which I joined um, after 9-11 to really find ways to serve and, and connect um, the opportunities I have been gifted back into community spaces. Um, and in that space, I was looking at environmental justice, immigrant rights, um, and LGBTQ rights at that time. Before all of that, I was... Um, I was a tech consultant, immigrant, daughter, mom, you name it. We all carry many identities and experiences, but all of those have informed how I walk and view the world and a consciousness of how much I don't know. Because in each step of my journey, I was exposed to things that I didn't know existed or didn't fully understand. And I say that because that's something that is a very conscious and necessary space when we're talking about equity and change um, is this ability to be cognizant of the discomfort and letting go of convenience in the search for justice. Next slide, please. Uh, and so adventures, um, what we, we say we do is that we work together um, to create a shared and prosperous economic future where zip code, race, gender, or immigration status do not dictate income or wealth. To us, this means that we are both leading and serving, that we're the teacher and the students at all times in all roles. Um, we see our work as in partnership with people who are living their daily lives, who are experts at what our society and how our society functions. And we have expertise to share. And together, we can create something that is more equitable. Next slide, please. Um, I think, we, um, I think we might have skipped the slide or two, but in, in essence, what we, what we say is that what drives ventures is the recognition that in the systems that we live in, in the structures that we currently live in, they were not designed for equity. In fact, the structures that we're currently living in were designed to create the outcomes that they're giving us. Um, and so some people benefit from those outcomes. And so when we talk about wealth and income inequality is not because they just happenstance. It's more like because it was assigned that way. And so if we want different outcomes, if we want different um, outcomes in equity, including economic equity, we have to take a hold of that. We need to create something new that from the basis, from its initiative, from its very start is focused on equity. And so at Ventures, we like to say that the secret of change is to focus all your energy not on finding the old, but on building the new. This doesn't take away that there's much necessary work to be done today in addressing immediate needs of people. But if we ever want to move to a new reality, we have to start imagining differently, dreaming differently, thinking of things we never would have thought about because each and every one of us has grown up and been conditioned to this world as it is with its current rules that have created inequity. So to dare to think something else is actually a tremendous amount of courage and a tremendous amount of imagination and not to mention work because it is heavy work in its energy and in its focus. Next slide. Adventures, we see this space of where we are and where we wanna go. And there's a bridge, how do we get there? So when we talk about focusing on creating the new, um, we like to say that what we're creating is the pieces of the puzzle of the future that we want. What are those pieces of the puzzle? 
We have a few pieces already running. This is what we call a transformational programs. And I'll start with a few um, to, to give you a sense of what they are. And I'll go into detail for each of them in a little bit. If I can go to the next slide. The bottom line is that all these pieces of the puzzles are connected. Similar to the core interconnectedness, nothing lives in a vacuum. All systems work on each other. The legal system works with the economy, works with the job market, works with education, and they all feed into each other. That is why it's so complicated and so complex because everything's connected. And everything that we're doing today was informed by the past and who we are and our lived experiences inform how we function within these systems. Next one. So adventures and specifically, um, I'm gonna go into as an example of the hard work that it is. Because we have the transformational uh, programs, which I'll go in a little bit, but those are outcomes or outputs of very intense work. When we say that we have to create the new, it's from the inside out. How do we function as an organization that is also part of the solution that we're trying to build outside? And so for ventures, or three strategic goals or organizational goals are really tied to that equity frame, things that we have to really challenge. Number one is community-owned structures. How do we say that we're working together in community in a way that's truly community-owned? This is a step above and beyond what some might know as community-informed. So beyond listening sessions or beyond surveys or community conversations, right? What does it mean to have real community ownership of a structure, like a nonprofit? What does that mean for the board makeup, the stewardship of that board, the power that board holds? What about staff? What does that mean for community ownership when you're looking at the makeup of your staff or the training of that staff, right? Community building communications. When you're talking about your nonprofit as just one entity, one structure in a system, how is the communication of your nonprofit's work is allowing for the power of the community to show up, not as a fundamental tool, not replaying all narratives of people in need looking for a savior, but really looking at ways that push the narrative forward in terms of equity and justice, of belonging, and making sure that people all are welcome and supported. And lastly, when we talk about equity and community, it requires relationships. And relationships are not easy. So in the nonprofit structure, how do you balance those relationships, keep each other informed, knowing that there's limited financial resources, but also keeping in local and the, and the journey of, of what some may call collective impact, but it's really about um, facilitating, encouraging, and leveraging all the work to create the new future. Next slide, please. I'm gonna go a little bit, and if there's any questions, please put them in the chat or feel free to, to interrupt me. I wanna have a conversation with you all. Um, so when we talk about uh, community-owned structures, this is examples of the steps we've taken, adventures, as an organization to start questioning these things. One is the board itself is there to provide collective stewardship. And this definition was really important because legally there's not much other responsibility from the state or legal structure, so what a board does. Now, in the nonprofit sector, you hear a lot about, is it a fund development board? Is it a working board? Is it, but all of those are self-imposed. As far as the state is concerned, they're just fiduciary responsible for the activities of the nonprofit, and you only need three. So a lot of the things that we think about best practices or purposes of the board are self-dictated by the sector, which is part of the system, um, and the people within it which are also part of the system. So for ventures, we're like a board is really about collective stewardship, right? Um, and it is a space for us where we practice the how of the what. So we want economic justice, what does that look like? How is that done? How do elections get placed, right? How is it a place of, of healing, joy, and belonging? How is it a place of, I would say, dreaming and scheming, right? A place for bold and strategic imagination. Um, and then all of our work, explicitly and intentionally centers and addresses racial and gender equity, inclusive of undocumented immigrants. So this is really important. Um, the current structures, current systems, including, quite frankly, think about the Roberts Rules of Orders that go into most arrangements. 
that was done by a former, um, you know, uh, I think it was officer um, who just came up with all of these structures and now we all follow them, right? Well, who, who said that's the best way? How is it a best practice? How do we challenge that? What does it look like differently? How do communities of color or communal communities or indigenous communities navigate difficult decision-making? And so who gets left out from simple structures where we may entitle a simple, it's actually really important. And unless we explicitly say, how are we including or how are people being currently excluded into every decision, then we won't get there. And this actually takes a lot of time and intention um, in our approach. And, and so just, just the mindset of this, is, this has been two years in the works, <laughs> we're still in the journey. Um, and this is just within ventures. And I, I say that because this is not uh, easy work. It is not a slogan, it's not a bullet point of values. This is really intensive and sometimes um, work that is as both personal and systemic. Like why, why do we react a certain way? Why do we question certain things? And it takes a lot of patience. And, and um, I know my, my communications people don't like when I use the word love, but it, it takes a lot of love, both for self and for others, to find the space to create this conversation. Uh, next slide, please. In the discussion of collective stewardship, um, we created what we call the management table. Because at Ventures, we say everybody's a leader. And we believe it, everybody's a leader, whether you're an assistant, a coordinator, or a director, everybody's a leader. And the institution in which we currently live still needs management structures and support. And so we created the Morcajete. And then Morcajete is those little pestle things where you smash in the earth and make salsa. So our idea of the Morcajete is the management comes in, takes tough issues, passes it out, brings it back to the full team for input and discussion. And it's like a little working group of key managerial decisions. They don't take the final vote, the vote's taken by all the staff. So an example would be, we recently had a, a discussion about the need for um, child care stipends or care stipends for people going out to conferences above and beyond their normal nine to five. And so we had all the staff put in their ideas, um, management had some ideas, we discussed it, brought it back to the team and then brought it to the board for approval. That's a, a, a use of the management table. Um, that we call it mocajete, for lack of a, another term. Next slide. And then the same thing, in terms of the structures, we instituted a minimum salary. And the minimum salary is the living wage based on the MIT a living wage calculator. And we also instituted a maximum salary, where the maximum salary is three times the minimum salary. For uh, retirement contributions, we did not base it on a match because a match contribution means that those with higher incomes get a bigger match and those with lower incomes get a lower match and those with lower incomes have less disposable income to contribute and take advantage of the match. Instead, what we did is we calculate the average salary across all positions and then make a 7% equivalent of that average salary as a shared value contribution to everybody who worked a minimum of a thousand hours that year. And that's the retirement contribution. We see it as part of a benefit that goes back to the employees. We complete staff, board, and community demographic census and review to make sure and have eyes wide open. What gaps are we missing from the board, from the staff? Um, which community members are we not reaching? How do we partner better? We updated the employee handbook to the eighth grade reading level. Um, not all our staff is a college graduate or even necessarily a high school graduate. So we want to make sure that the duties and responsibilities that they're going to be working under is understandable and at their reach. We couldn't go lower um, because we do need, based on our work, we do need eighth grade level as that's our minimum. But that, that's examples of how we have applied this idea of, of community ownership, transparency and equity into the operation of the organization. Next slide. In terms of communications, uh, there's three things I'll, I'll do really quickly. One is the media release. Our media release for all community members allows them to, one, identify if they want a different name used. 
But it also clearly states that if at any time the community partner wants their image, voice, or comments to not be included, they have ultimate ownership of those images and they can resent the permission they gave us to use it at any time. We brought the reading level of that release down as well and make it available. And the storytelling, um, this is the hardest part, honestly, because the storytelling, we, how do we ensure that the power of the story is with the community member and not the nonprofit? What is the connection between the story and the narrative shifts we want to see happen um, in community? So it's both how do we collect the stories, how do you share the stories, but how do you have the ultimate owners of the story be the ones that are building the benefit and the power um, that comes from that storytelling? This is still a journey. We, we haven't gotten it quite right, um, but we're learning it with community um, and, we, and, and we'll share those as they come out. Um, but to us, what's important is that we center the voice of the community and the ownership of how the story is shared with the community's members whose story it is. This is not the story necessarily of ventures or the benefit of participating in a ventures program. It's really the story of our community members, um, their strength and assets and contribution in community and their vision and dreams of what is possible. And lastly, um, the literacy review. <laughs> this is um, literacy review, everything, everything. Uh, and, and this one, I'll use an example. We had um, we were working on a program with national partners to develop a cooperative, um, and these are partners we work for with the years. All of us happen to be um, first gen or recent immigrant backgrounds um, with a cultural competency of the targeted community, and so there was a, a sense of uh, we know what we're doing. You know, a little bit of um, ego maybe, right? Um, but at the end, after we did the documents and we were very happy with them, um, you know, we have a process. I'm like, let's send it to the literacy review before it goes out. And they came back at the seventh grade level. And so just sit with that for a second. This is documents created by immigrants, Latina immigrants or first gen immigrants um, with lived experience from the population. Right, you, you hear that a lot. And it still came back at the 17th grade level. And it's because we forget. You forget sometimes things that you don't question because they're your comfort and your space. And it took us five months to bring him down. And we couldn't bring it down lower than the eighth grade. But keep in mind that most of the community that we're working with is third grade reading level. So talk about an awakening, right? Having lived experience is not enough to say that you know what the community needs. It's a great starting point. But having the humbleness to know that you still don't know everything and allowing them to have the ultimate say, it's, it takes time, but it's, it's extremely important. Next slide. In terms of the relationship building um, with communities, you know, we, we continue to want to be collaborative whenever we can, um, including in, in the launch of programs like Semillitas and Alas, and I'll go into each of those cases in a second. Um, what this means is that we know we don't have all the answers. And we know we have some answers and that our partners are doing great work. And even if they're not our partners, they might be doing great work. How do we lift up and leverage their work, find the gaps where we can contribute, and find the spaces where we can collaborate together? And sometimes we're moving so fast in our effort to create the change we want or, or the road we want that we don't stop enough to make sure that our partners are there with us or the communities are with us. And so this constant engagement, this constant check-in is really important. So that the, 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 at the end of the day, the, the benefit of the work that we want to see is not ventures, is the community. And, and if they are not there in full ownership as it rolls out, they're not going to be there when we move away, right? And we, you know, to us, the world will be great when an agency like ventures is no longer needed. And so we need to make sure that our pieces are, are as community-owned, structured, and collective as possible because collective is what's going to carry it to the next stage. Um, we also are part of state and regional coalitions, national coalitions, because there's so much knowledge. The knowledge is not only limited here to the Santa Cruz or Monterey Bay, 
um, there's amazing work being done globally, nationally, statewide. And I just, in fact, came back from a um, guaranteed income coalition meeting. Um, I know we're going to a meeting on, on home care and, and we and we go to all of these spaces because there's much to share and much to learn together um, and bring ideas that can can grow or region um, in a way that, that really focus on, on, on the thriving of the future. Next slide. All right, before I jump into really in the weeds, because I, I just gave you an overview from an organizational standpoint on how we navigate these questions of, of system and equity spaces. Because to get to the point of an equitable economy, you, you need to understand all the, if this is how much work it takes to run one nonprofit, imagine taking on the system. And I know it can be daunting, but, but it is a step at a time. So I don't know if there's any questions about our work in terms of ventures as a case model um, for organizational structures focused on equity before I jump into the programs and why those pieces are in incredibly important to an equitable economy. And I don't see any comments or hands jumping up, so I'm gonna keep moving us forward. All right, um, so if I go from this kind of sense of as an organization into what it can look like from a program design, next slide. The, the first thing for us is asking the why and to what end, right? Like I said, Ventures at its core is a system change maker, trying to create the pieces of the puzzle of the future where we have equitable distribution of income and wealth. That's what we're trying to do. So what do these pieces look like? What should they look like? And why and to what end? What, what are they achieving in those questions? And this is really critical when you think about economic equity because you're gonna hear a lot about economic development or business development. And sometimes you'll hear about um, economic mobility or job creation as equivalent to that equity, but that's not necessarily the case. You can have a lot of jobs and still have an equitable outcomes and income and wealth, right? You can have a lot of businesses and still have an equitable accumulation of wealth because maybe it's a large entity where the CEO gets most of the, way of the income of that profit and not necessarily the workforce, right? So the big question is why are we doing X strategy and what will it accomplish to give us different results? Next slide. So how we like to say adventures, how we get to that point is we have a lot of conversations and we focus conversations with those most harmed in the current system. In the Central Coast, that happens to be Latina women. Latina women earned 42 cents to the dollar, which is the largest income gap in the region. And I love data, so I like to go with data. Um, there's other groups that also have income and wealth gaps. That's just one of the issues we do. We have conversations with families that are most harmed by the system, right? And then we do a lot of research and investigation into what are the models of evidence and based data that is out there. And then we have conversations with decision makers, right? Institutional decision makers, like economic development plans and, and climate adaptation plans and people in the city council or county boards. Um, we just talk to a lot of people and we start to connect the dots between the conversations on the ground, re research available and conversation with leaders and trying to think through what could come out of the spaces. And it's not like an easy, it's not a one and one and one conversation is a constant loop back. So we might go to the family, they'll say, well, what really matters to me is my kids. Then we'll go to the research, I'm like, well, these are some research strategies, right? And then we'll go back to the families and say, what about these? <laughs> and they're like, nope. And then it go back again. Or we'll be in the middle of a county board meeting and a supervisor may be proposing something based on research they found. So then, then we're gonna research into that, take their idea back to the community and it's a little, constant loop through this funnel until something comes out. <laughs> so something comes out into a design and then we pilot it and then we evaluate it if it's having the, again, we're trying to design this new puzzle piece that we don't know what it is. And that's both the beauty and the hard part of our work. Next slide. So one of those pieces was actually Semillitas. Semillitas is a program in Santa Cruz County. Um, it creates a college savings account at time of birth, um, and it creates it with a seed contribution, semillitas meet uh, small seed. And, and after that, 
uh, as the child grows and meets certain uh, milestones in their development, we have partnerships that add more money into the account with total opportunities equal about $500 by the time the child turns five. And there were three goals to Semillitas, improving child development, uh, building expectations for higher education, and to build healthy lifelong financial habits. And, and that's the end product. So if you just imagine the funnel I went through, so what came out of the funnel was semillitas, right? Next slide. This is the research piece of that bubble in that funnel. There was research done in Oklahoma and they had data in San Francisco and Oakland as well, that children, especially children from low and moderate income households with a college savings account early on in life, as early as birth, with just a dollar or even less than $500, were three times more likely to attend college and four times more likely to graduate. There was clear evidence-based data around this approach. When we talked to families, families were like, we were like, what's your dreams? What's your barriers? What do you want? They're like, well, I really want to set up my child to succeed, but I need to make sure that they have food and shelter and I don't have money for much else, right? So we had those conversations with families we had these conversations with the researchers about this outcome and with elected officials. Uh, we had conversations about their goals and also with the health savings, um, the health service agency. You know, there was a lot of uh, focus on early childhood development in the county, a lot of interest in uh, decreasing maternal depression, right? And a, and a lot of uh, interest in the kind of cradle to career approaches. So all of these three pieces were kind of rolling together until we came up with Semillita. And um, at core, not to steal the, the, the name, the coast, but at core, what Semillita really is about is creating a puzzle piece of this future we want where every child is welcome at birth. I know we have the three outcomes for Semillitas, but from a lens of ventures and economic equity, we're creating what we, we called in, this, in, in our lingo, the commons a universal program where everybody gets it, right? But with using targeted universalism where those with less get a little bit more, they get a, a higher seed and they have higher access to milestones that they are already doing. We work really hard with the community partners to say these are not incentives. Parents are by far, by far and wide good parents. Far and wide they will take care of their child's health and they will take care to give their child what they need. So to grow these accounts, we're gonna lean on that, what economists will say, economic behavior, behavior economics, right? And say, we are gonna do a, a, a new program that creates a sense of belonging from birth that helps those with less, more, and those that have it is still there for them, right? that ties together health and economic stability and asset building with parent education to allow people to know that the dreams are balanced from birth. And, that, and by the way, the data supports it, right? So Semiquitas to me is a wonderful example of taking a really dream of the future, everybody belongs and everybody's dreams is valid, right? So taking that with data, community voices, um, needs of governance together to develop a tool that works, right? Um, to date, Semitas has over 7,000 families in Santa Cruz County alone. But most importantly to me is the data that has come out. When we did the base survey for Semitas at launch, the aspirations of the parent was a two-year college or high school graduation for their child. Right now, the aspiration is graduate school. I'm not saying Semitas did all that work, but it's a contribution to it, right? And then it's affordable design model of what is possible when we work together, because this is not a program of ventures. We, we say we'd like to power it, but it, it took the county office of ed, first five, the county, health, health, human service agency, the health service agency, you know, you, you name it, they jump on, Dientes, Salud para la Gente, Santa Cruz Community Health Centers. Um, it was really a joint commitment because there was a joint uh, opportunity to imagine something greater for our community. Um, next slide. And again, if there's any questions, jump in. Um, on DocuFund, 
Monterey Bay, this is another program of ours. Um, and that you fund launched um, right at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. The beginning of the COVID pandemic, I got a call and somebody say, I have this mom who's undocumented. What resources can she have? And I said, I don't know, give me a minute. And then I got another call. And then I called my, my colleagues in, um, in Ventura County who had an undocu fund called 805 undocu fund. And I said, how did you do it? How'd you do it? What happened? And then the next call was, okay. So that first caller, I'm going to, if I create something, would you join in? <laughs> and it was pure trust. There was no MOU at the time. But we've been working together on social determinants of health for a while. And they say yes. And then I called another one. And then I called another one. And soon enough, I had seven colleagues who said, yes, just tell me what to do. Right? We'll figure it out. And then I had one brave funder who, who said, well, I'm not sure exactly what you're trying to do, but it sounds good. <laughs> Let's give it a shot. And it was a, it was a I think it was a $20,000 grant. It's very tiny, but very instrumental because what we were really creating at UndocuFund in the very beginning was the way of designing relief efforts in the way that was owned, not by the funder, by the very community impacted by the harm. All those leaders were leaders of color of immigrant descent or immigrants themselves, right? And so in the design of UndocuFund, when I first wrote down, like, we're gonna make sure that the community voice is helping lead however this happens. We'll figure it out. Because this wasn't about raising a bunch of money. It, it did. We raised over, or now it's over $6 million. Um, And it wasn't about helping a lot of families. It did. It has helped over 6,000 families. This is a heat map uh, done in partnership with UC Santa Cruz uh, Blum Center. I'm, I'm sorry, the Global Health um, Partnership. But the biggest thing it did was leverage what everybody had, right, and, and um and just kind of reimagine who gets to control the say of what relief is. We were the first relief partner who had no strings attached to the relief, just like the tax credit that came from many who were documented. We say, it's just cash. You know your family, you know your need, we're in an emergency, do what you need to do, right? Um, and so we were challenging that relief didn't need to be, let me pay your landlord or let me buy you a food basket, right? And it's only one time. We were like really challenging the discourse of what a safety net really meant and what self-determination and dignity could take the front lead in emergency situations. So I tell people on DocuFund, yeah, the money, great. But we really challenged what it meant to step up for people and letting people have self-determination and dignity when they're in need, which is really crucial for safety nets. And we were one of the first at the end of, uh, towards the end of UndocuFund, no, not the end, it's still going, but at the, at, towards the end of COVID, uh, we had one funder that really heard us when we said we can't do one-time relief. It's not sufficient enough. Let us try um, everything we learned from, because the community was coming back to us and telling us it's not enough, something else was needed. And so we looked at Stockton, who had at that time just wrapped up their uh, Stockton Guaranteed Income Pilot with tons of data on the model. And we said, we're going to do it. We did a guaranteed income pilot here with UndocuFund funds uh, with 15 families, one of the first pilots that was totally focused on undocumented community, um, just to show the impact of guaranteed income. And again, it's about challenging what is the safety net. You know? And we, we just proved what Stockton proved, that cash works. Those families that receive 500 steady income a month for six months, this is just six months. You know, they established emergency savings. Household income went on average up by $1,500. Many used it to buy healthcare, housing, food, right? Um, used it to pay childcare so they could seek better jobs. 30% so started or grew their micro enterprises. 30% filed taxes for the first time. Think, think what that means. This is a, a limitedly overseen distribution of cash. That means we don't have a lot of scaffolding in terms of the management of poor people. We simply say, we trust you and we're here with you during this emergency, flipping what the script is about the safety net. It's not about policing poor people, it's about trusting each other as neighbors and be there for each other as neighbors. And I can tell you that during the course of the COVID pandemic, we kept track of everything. We only had three people apply twice. 
and they were a year apart. So the, those, there it is, the fraud or abuse, they're just not there. They're just not there. And this allowed us to prove it. Again, imagine a different safety net that is about self-determination and trust, right? And that takes away all that heavy and expensive um, patronization of people who just because of their economic instability, they're seen as less than capable of taking care of their family. So we wanna challenge that narrative. And so that's another example of UndocuFund, again, a very pragmatic, immediate um, manifestation of economic justice of a comments around dignity and self-determination. Next slide. And I just said all of this, I'm gonna skip this one. <laughs> this is the name of the guaranteed income um, model we have. And we continue to do it, we're on our uh, going to our eighth um, cohort. Like I said earlier, um, building an infrastructure of a complex ecosystem requires collaborative approach and a broader culture shift on how we work and what purpose of system serves. I'd, I, I'd like to say that we have a social contract with every piece of the system and every system that we're a part of. There is a social contract that we allowed it to exist. Many are not delivering on that social contract because if they were, we wouldn't see the gaps we have based on race or gender or immigration. We wouldn't see the gaps that we have in housing. We wouldn't see the gaps that we have in the care of the earth, right? The social contract for a lot of these systems is that we would be better off for living in the societies with the systems and the rules that we have. And so if they're not delivering, we have to start addressing what needs to change. But this change is not easy, right? It, and it's hard. And it takes a level of um, commitment and love to stay in it. It also means the recognition that alone we can't do it and that you will need a break. You will need a break because you can't do it alone. You need the team and you need to do it together. And having that bright light of to the why and to what end allows you to continue in the system. I, I tell my, my team all the time, we have big ideas. And we're working with systems that have been operating for centuries. To think that you're going to fix it in one grant period is ridiculous, right? But we can have momentum and move it forward a little at a time. Uh, next slide. So everything begins with love. Next. And with dignity and respect for people and planet. Next slide. In community and by the community. Next. And we want to create a world where all are valued, valuable, and worthy, including our planet. Next. And just a reminder, we are both leading and serving. We are of and for the communities we live in and share this world with. It is mutual and it is shared and it is inherently loving. Next. And I'll leave that to the questions um, and open it up. Maria, thank you so much. I always learn something listening to you and I, I love the infusion of love and what, what you're talking about here. And um, I hope that more people will get to um, listen to your presentation um, later since it's being recorded because there's just so much in it um, that's inspiring and also very, very real about how you got to the point that you're you're in with your colleagues and these programs. So the framing is so helpful. But um, I'm sure others have questions and reactions. Some of you may be hearing about this um, anew and some of you may be familiar with some pieces of it but haven't seen it all put together this way or know, know more about its origins. But whether you have questions large or small for Maria, this is an opportunity to, to ask and, um, and interact. So let us know. You can raise your hand or jump in or Put something in the chat if that feels more comfortable. Heather asked a question in the chat. Can I read that out loud or do you want to read that, Nicole? 
I'm happy to. Um, given the educational goals, does Ventures liaise with UndocU slugs and other groups in local higher education? Thank you, Heather, for the question. Yeah, thanks, Heather. Um, so we have connected with uh, the higher ed organizations. Semillitas is, is right now very focused on zero to five. So our initial conversations with um, Cabrillo, UCSD, and, and other groups has been to let them aware and, and to make sure that we think about it in terms. And I know right now the Semillitas director is working on uh, developing a volunteer model so that we can have maybe first-gen students who want to take the calls and welcome their parents and their kids into the program. Um, we we want to make sure that uh, that's available. Um, but our, our oldest kid is just turned five. So we're still, <laughs> they're still not there yet. Um, we will get there, uh, but thank you for that. And it's a reminder to, again, continue that conversation forward. Thanks. And Heather's also calling out how inspiring the organizational framework is in the chat. Thank you, Heather. Any other questions, reactions? All right. I don't I, I hear none, but I'll say one thing. Um, I think all of us carry uh, those moments of doubt, like where am I doing what I'm doing? Or like you're really tired. Like I said, I've been at it for over 20 years um, in different seats and different spaces. Um, so I, you know, right now I was just like, oh my gosh, okay, Nicole, so I'm going to go in there and give you everything. But uh, some days I just, you know, um, but you just got to breathe it out. And for me, it's just a reminder, again, we're, we're working with systems that have been in use for hundreds of years. And if you look behind me, I have an image of a field. But agriculture was founded on the premise of serfdom, at least in the Western culture, right? And agriculture uh, survived in the U.S. because of slavery, the way it was done. So to think about an industry, which is one of the top industries for the state of California, that is dependent on low wage work, right, or farm workers, it's not because they're just the happen to be the Latina farm workers. They used to be Japanese workers. They used to be Chinese workers. They used to be someone else who was poorer than or less wanted. And so the economic model of that industry, centuries old. And so we have to, it doesn't mean that it doesn't produce great produce or great benefit, but it raises a lot of questions of use of the soil, or use of labor, or use of water. And I think those questions are very valid questions. So when we talk about economic development, a lot of times you hear a lot of terms about talking to the economists or the professionals, right? Or the specialists. <laughs> um, who better than the worker? Who better than the mom who's the neighbor to those fields to know what the impact is? We know the impact. Let us not be fools in thinking that because we're not the one with the title, it is not our economy. It is our economy. It is our communities as a school system. And I think, like I said, we human beings created all of this. Human beings can change all of this. And it's just a matter of having that, that massive patience with oneself and, and grace and forgiveness because we're going to mess up. We are absolutely going to mess up because we don't know everything. And we don't know the journey that our brothers or sisters may be walking in. And how do we walk in better allyship and with more thoughtfulness? So I thank you all for your time and for your questions and your comments. Ventures is hiring for co-op developers, if you know anybody. <laughs> That's my plug, selfish plug. That's a um, great plug. <laughs> thank you all for having me today. May Thanks. I say yeah. something? Is it of still course. available for comments? I'm sorry, yeah. um, I am commuting, so I've been just listening without my video. And um, my name is Liz, and I'm the director of a nonprofit called Safe Families for Children. And I just wanted to say a humongous thank you for sharing all of your wisdom and um, guidance. And I, I wish I was on my a desk because I had so many notes I wanted to take on <laughs> everything you said. And I'm going to listen to the recording later. But um, you're very inspirational for those of us that are leading organizations and fumbling and wanting to grow and do a better job. And I just, I just thank you for your time and what you're giving to 
our community and everybody. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Liz, for sharing that. And completely agree. Very inspiring. And, and thanks also, Maria, for the attention to the, the doing as well as the undoing that's necessary. It's such a good reminder of just trying to think about all these structures that we're all embedded in and, and trying to both observe, but also change. So really appreciated that, that lens. Um, are there other questions or comments? A question, Maria, can you share some of your thoughts or strategies in terms of um, how you or your staff or what you do in situations where, you know, we often work with other human service professionals that, you know, on one hand, we all talk about equity and equity and equity and equity. And we all, you know, and community engagement and all that, like we talk the talk. And then um, there's still many times when then the way that the work happens, right, it's still very much kind of the status quo or, kind of those systems and structures are all about the rules and the procedures and the policy. And so it's kind of like this uh, disconnect between the, right, the words that come out of our mouths are all in agreement with each other and then <laughs> still falling back on, um, you know, the, and, you know, process is good and structures and systems and policies are, are necessary. And also um, there, sometimes it can be hard to feel like, okay, how can I, or who am I to be the one raising those kinds of questions? You know, the why to what end and does it need to be this way? Especially if it's in a um, large group or there's kind of group think happening or the leaders of another organization or initiative aren't quite sold on that or don't see um, kind of the limitations there. And so what do you, what do you do in those kinds of situations to then not lose hope? <laughs> That's a good question. All right, I'm just going to answer it from my end. Um, there's, uh, there's a time and a place, right? And I would say that um, hmm, I think you need to speak truth when truth needs to be spoken. Um, it sounds differently from different people. Some people are, are like to, all of their pent up stuff comes out. Sometimes you have the diplomatic attempt. Sometimes uh, you have the murmur, passive aggressive, let me write it on the evaluation sheet, right? Um, so there's, it comes out, but I think truth needs to be spoken to. Um, I have found uh, that the intention uh, in most of the spaces in Santa Cruz, the intention, is, is to move towards equity. There's intention. Sometimes the education, right, of what that actually means, or like the pragmatic application of it um, is not always there. And, and it's not only in Santa Cruz County. So as an example, the state rolled out millions of dollars of funds for the, what they call the, the economic recovery dollars, the equitable recovery of the state, this big, bold plan to look at economic recovery in an equitable way. That was the whole purpose of those funds, right? Um, and they wanted it in a way that involved communities that were usually left out of these economic discussions. And by the way, the time of turnaround is a year for the plan and the proposal was less than three months. So who, who in the community who's usually left out isn't the know enough to even know that there's a proposal? Who in the community who hasn't been invested in ages has the necessary networks to apply for a $5 million grant to take the lead? But they're not, they can't, you know? It's just, no. So like you said, there's a big, bold um, messaging about what is desired. And then the application goes back to the same old, same old. So you'll see it in the lead agencies, most of them are, former economic development agencies or, or business development partners. Um, and they're doing the best, you know, I, I, I'll grant they're doing the best. Um, but this work is hard work because it is undoing so much and questioning everything. That's what, I don't even know everything. I can't, I absolutely can't. It's, it's Black History Month, right? What does that mean to my Black family and friends who are here in Santa Cruz who, uh, with the history of a sunset town. 
what that, did that mean for their continuation in this time? Um, I think for me, the best thing is to speak up, to speak up and not let it sit there. And I think for my team, what I say is that it is part of our job of our mission to speak up when they're whatever seat they're taking, whatever committee they're taking to speak up and call it out. Um, to be explicit, not only intentional, but explicit in what those gaps are. And I think for me, the term inequity is very valuable, but it hides the real crack at it, which is racial equity. If we are not willing to call out race and we're not willing to call out sexism, then we're leaving behind fundamental key parts that were designed into the system that created the inequities we have. They're baked in. And, I, and we have to call it out because if we don't call it out, you can create a very, what may look like equity, you know, and we all seen the cartoon, right? Of the, of maybe some of it's a cartoon with the uh, people looking over a fence to a baseball game, right? And so the tall person, medium sized person, short person, and one can't see across and we say, that's where we are. And then you look to equal, everybody gets the same size box to stand on. And then equity is everybody gets the needed boxes they need to look over the the fence and then they added a new slide that says liberation, you take the fence out, you know. But to me, uh, decolonization, right? True liberation means maybe we don't have those bleachers in the back end and we figure out why the hell are they even playing baseball? You know, like, these are the kind of questions of really questioning everything which take time. And sometimes the current systems don't allow us to have that time, um, but we have to fight for it and, and speak it out. And at, at a minimum, just say it. I, it's not about pointing fingers. These are systems. It's not like, yeah, there's individual actors and there's individual behaviors, but we're talking about systems we're all part in. Some of us are benefiting from it. Some of us are not. And I think those that are benefiting from it or somehow in spaces of, of privilege have even more responsibility to speak out. Um, I think as the ED, I have a lot more coverage than maybe my assistants or coordinators might feel and certain spaces. So there are spaces when I need to speak up, spaces where they feel I need to speak up more than they can, but allowing them to speak up when they can and knowing that if they mess up, I got their back. I got their back. I think being with each other, um, like, well, I don't know, it's so complex. You speak out and then lean with people who are with you. There's more people with you than you think and you can't move everything at once. It's a big boulder, right? So pick the corner and your partners and just don't stop pushing. That'd be my answer. Thanks so much, Maria. I appreciate that as well. Any other comments, little thoughts? I'm seeing lots of appreciation in the chat. Thanks. We, we have a few more events to tell you about, and we hope you'll spread the word about this one being available as a recording, because uh, we know not everybody could make it today. But uh, that's one of the reasons why we record everything, so that they'll live on. Um, so thanks to everyone for being here, for spreading the word, to Maria for the thoughtful and inspiring and very real presentation. Um, very much appreciated to Stella and Gisela for helping us offer this in both languages and to all of you for joining us. So looking ahead, there's a Parent Power Summit on the 10th. Nicole, do you wanna say a word about that? Just let people know. Yeah, the Parent Power Summit is hosted by the Central Coast Early Childhood Advocacy Network. And it's a tri-county uh, network, so Santa Cruz, Monterey, and San Benito counties, uh, primarily uh, organized and kind of started by the first five Santa Cruz counties, Monterey, San Benito counties, along with the uh, child care planning councils in each county. And so they're really focused on early childhood from birth to eight years old. And... Um, engaging parents, community leaders as uh, co-designers, as advocates uh, is a big focus of the network. And so every year they organize a parent power summit that is um, again, designed with parent leaders. There are workshops 
uh, offer that parent leaders are um, designing and facilitating themselves. And so if any of you uh, either work with or are a parent in this community or are just really interested in seeing kind of this model of agencies and community and parent leaders coming together to do uh, statewide advocacy work, the Parent Power Summit is a great opportunity to see that in action um, so that's this coming Saturday in Salinas. And then do you want me to talk about the next event we have this month, Nicole? Sure, sure. So we've been doing a, a regular series of workshops in partnership with DataShare Santa Cruz County. DataShare is that platform, that web-based platform that houses a whole bunch of community level indicators. And so we've partnered with DataShare to create um, basically an interactive version of the core results menu that has a number of indicators organized by core conditions. So we uh, periodically offer kind of a data literacy 101 workshop where we're really creating opportunities to practice using data share to find community level data. And then we alternate that with workshops that go a little bit deeper in terms of how do you use the data? What do you do with it once you find data how to use it for things like grant writing, for research, for program planning, for advocacy. And so that's what the next workshop on February 27th will focus on. How do you make meaning of community level data once you find it? Um, so again, the registration is available on the core website and uh, Gisela put that link in the chat. And uh, as well as the links to the feedback poll for today's session, or if you are uh, looking at this on screen and have a phone camera, you can scan the QR codes um, to respond in either English or Spanish. And again, we appreciate the feedback. It helps us know not only what we what worked well uh, about these core institute sessions, but how we can continuously improve and also what topics might be of interest in the future. So we will leave this up for a moment. We'll stay on for a few more minutes in case anybody has any lingering questions. And again, just want to also uh, echo the thanks to Maria for a fantastic presentation today.